You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 76 for January 20th, 2016. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, I turn the reins over to my co-hosts as they talk about the grand challenges in archaeology today. This is a supporting podcast to the blogging carnival of the same name taking place this month over at dougsarchaeology.wordpress.com. If you've got a blog and some thoughts on the subject, jot them down and send Doug the link. So grab a warm drink, sit by the fire, get ready to think big, because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Hi, welcome to the 76th episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. I'm your host today, Chris Sims. Our normal host, Chris Webster, couldn't join us this time, but he'll be back next time around. Uh, today, we've got with us uh, Bill White. Howdy. And Stephen Wagner. Hello. And Doug Rocks McQueen. Hello. So we're going to be talking about a, a uh, topic that Doug has presented on his blog um, as part of a blogging carnival. Doug, why don't you go ahead and explain the blogging carnival and the topic of uh, the challenges for archaeology? Yeah. So I'll just start with the blogging carnival. and uh, It's pretty simple. Um, they were very popular a couple of years ago, um, you know, pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter, um, when you sort of had to figure out a way to communicate with people. And the idea behind a blogging carnival is one blog puts out a, a topic, and that can be anything. There used to be a um, an anthropology blogging carnival, which was for Stone Hearth, and it could be random topics such as um, migration, you know, archaeology, anything in there. And then basically they put out a call with this question. Other bloggers around the blogosphere respond in their own posts and their own blogs. It all gets linked back together, and at the end, the person who put out the question sums it all up and puts out links. So everyone else who participated can kind of see what everyone else said. Um, it's sort of a nice sort of way for people to find out about other blogs that are out there and see what other people's thoughts are on a topic. And so there's been a couple of them over the years. Um, it hasn't been one in... I did, I think, the last one in archaeology. Um, actually, I think Matt Law did one maybe a year ago, year and a half. Um, so it's it's been a while. And so um, I put out this question, and the question is fairly simple. It's basically, what do you see as the grand challenges of your archaeology? And that was based off of about two, well, almost three years ago, um, there was a survey that went out about what are the grand challenges of archaeology? And it got some responses, but th there's lots of people who point out some interesting responses that came back. 40% of the responses they didn't include because it wasn't scientific archaeology. And typically the demographic of the people that responded tend to be older, white, male, um, later career archaeologists. So I thought the idea was, you know, it's interesting if we expand this out and really saw what people thought are the grand challenges of archaeology. And so that's the question I pose to everyone is, what are the grand challenges of your archaeology? And it can be as local and specific as you want, or it can be as wide ranging as you want it to be. Um, and so far, we've got some really interesting responses come back. We've got uh, talks about space archaeology, um, Medieval archaeology in northern England, so very specific stuff, very wide-ranging stuff as well. So um, basically, for this podcast, the idea is just to see what you guys' thoughts are on what are the grand challenges of your archaeology. So um, I will open that question up to everyone else, and you can tell me what you think. Bill, uh, you want to kick it off? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, uh, what would anyone like better than to hear me talk? <laughs> I, I I wrote my blog post and of course I kind of went you know way out there and, and just kept going and going but uh, uh, it's it's scheduled to come out on Monday and I figured that there was really actually three grand challenges because I mean the very first thing that I thought that came to mind was the curation crisis I mean we're just running out of places to store all the stuff we dig up and um, especially if you've been paying attention to the uh, Illinois State Museum situation where they closed down the State Museum to save a whopping, you know, few million dollars on the state budget. Uh, it doesn't seem like repositories are, you know, really of much importance to a lot of the legislators and then, you know, the constituencies that they represent. So um, uh, it doesn't seem like they're adding any more 
uh, places for us to store the artifacts. However, especially in the United States with the pickup and the uh, economy, and it seems like they're doing more construction, there's going to be more archaeology. We're going to find more stuff. Uh, and that stuff is going to have to somehow find its way into these already crowded repositories. So that was definitely one um, uh, grand challenge that I came up with. And then also the grand, the even more, the grander challenge, which I feel like as far as uh, curation uh, of storing all our digital data. So along with all these projects are tons and tons of files, uh, photos. I'm asking uh, monitors now to give me videos of what they're seeing now on their phones or on their uh, cameras. So even bigger photo files, um, all the GIS information. And then, you know, if you have a chance or you're lucky or you have the kind of project that allows you to do so to record oral histories, you know, you can do it on your phone or you can do it uh, with a digital recorder. Um, that's a lot of data. And right now it's being stored in these really rickety closets that have servers at every CRM company and uh, or, or stored on these random uh, record DVR discs that are just in a drawer somewhere at a university. I mean, we actually don't really know where a lot of the data that we've collected is at as far as the digital data. And so um, the way that it works now, you just curate all that information along with your artifacts. And so there's there's um, there's a lot of uh, uh, motivation for us to go paperless and that's going to result in like you know gigabytes more of data in fact the entire project will all be digital data so where are we going to store all that and so um there was only there's only a few options that i'm aware of tdar is the most um uh the most like uh, uh forthcoming option to store it in a cloud-based storage system um at the uh, arizona state university and then have them migrate your data over time but that costs money so it's not really that huge of an amount if you think about it, especially if you're a cultural resources company and you're passing that on to your clients. Uh, but I feel like that's a better option than trying to keep servers alive. So the biggest, the, the like most uh, prescient concern that I figured was um, uh, the curation crisis. But then I, I identified some other some other things that are uh, that are really important, like the situation of field techs. Essentially, we're moving to a world where the field techs all are going to have masters. And then in 100 years, it's going to be like everybody has a PhD. And that's, I also mentioned in there how um, artificial intelligence, you know, might play a role. And they're already trying to do AI excavators, where it's just a machine, the backhoe is doing excavation. So all those shovel probes and all that stuff that's going on, like there's nothing that's going to prevent in the future, you know, a machine, a small backhoe or some kind of little track hoe from digging all the shovel probes in a few seconds so as that all that all moves along especially with an ai machine that's hooked into tdar or some of these other ones and has the information of every single crm report that's been done in the last 40 years like you know where's that going to leave text so like the the um the barrier to entry for an archaeologist is going to get super high because you're going to need a master's to even be a tech and then at that point, you're also going to need to know all this other stuff in order to run the machine. And then the third, the third challenge that I thought, uh, that I thought of, um, has to do with like who is an archaeologist. So before it was guys that were just sitting in an armchair in England and just reading these reports from traders and stuff about Indonesia, and then writing about races or, you know, guys that are going over to Turkey and just plundering these ancient. Uh, Greek settlements for gold so that they can put them in their um, their museum. Uh, and then that changed to where it was like a more diverse group of individuals. I mean, it does seem like it's dominated by white people, but at least there's different classes and different uh, research interests that are all being put in there. However, with this movement for citizen archaeology and uh, public outreach and stuff, uh, there's, there's much more of this like, you know, be an archaeologist for a day. Let's connect with the public and teach them about archaeology. They can come and dig and they can volunteer. Well, all of that also takes away work from um, uh, field techs, but it also creates a situation where like local communities are their own archaeologists. So they don't necessarily, in fact, even need us anymore. So the DNA of who is an archaeologist is going to change. And so I kind of just, I kind of figured that in the next hundred years, there's going to be massive change in archaeology. And, um, if you think it was dominated by white guys with PhDs now, just wait until you see what happens 100 years from now. Wow. 
Uh, Doug, you've got something to say about that. Uh, yeah, so actually, I, have, uh, I, I think Stephen has a comment on the middle middle one of Bill's. So the first one was just to say, Bill, your concern is not just limited to the United States. I can tell you right now, in the UK, there's been a curation crisis, and it's just growing. So unlike, say, most states in the United States where there's sort of a central storage or, you know, the National Forest or National Park Service has their own storage for regions or states and stuff like that. Curations handled by museums in the UK and about half of the museums that used to take archaeological collections no longer accept them. They no longer have the money. Uh, budgets are being slashed. They no longer have the space. And so I would say that I, I don't have the hard facts to back this up. I can tell you right now, at least... Um, and the United States and the UK, it's of a huge problem. And I would say probably most places around the world, there's a huge problem with storage of artifacts. Uh, Stephen, you work in Canada now. Do you, is there a problem up there? Um, I'm not sure, but I'm going to say yes. Uh, at least in Alberta, everything goes to uh, one central repository. I can't imagine how... There isn't a space issue, but I haven't really heard anybody talking about it. It's just kind of one of those things that you box it up and send it off. So at least where, you know, in the type of position that I'm in, um, you know, no, you know, that kind of information is not really trickling down. So I, I really can't say, but you know, I, I do think it's like you say, it's it's worldwide. It's pretty prevalent, and if it isn't now. It's going to be. It's, that's just you know basic math, right? Yeah. Um, and now I'll go back to Bill to your last comment about um, people and you know public archaeology sort of taking away the work of professional archaeologists. And I've had this told to me so many times. Um, and I've I've had you know people in professional archaeology be like, oh, I I, I hate community groups. Every time they do a dig, it means it's, they're taking work away that can be done by professionals. And I don't think that's the case. Um, one, I don't see amateurs, uh, I, I hate to use that term, but people who don't do it as a professional living, so they're not paid to do archaeology. I mean, if you look at the complexity of doing an excavation and doing it professionally into a standard, and even now, I mean, now most most archaeologists are playing around with drones um, and you know that requires in the United States some sort of license in the UK it requires going to a two-day course um, there's all sorts of very highly technical stuff that goes into an excavation and yeah I think you know avocational sort of um, communities could have handled it a hundred years ago when all you had to do is take a pickaxe and a shovel and only pick out the really pretty parts and toss everything else into the spoil heap. But now I think it's so complex that you can't have it art professional archaeologists replace. And I see most even avocational excavations usually have a professional archaeologist there to help people out. Um, so I'm not sure if we're going to ever go to the point where archaeology can be replaced by the community. We might be re replaced by robots, as you're talking about, but I... I, sorry, that's a pet peeve of mine, is people talking about how communities are taking away, you know, taking the food out of our mouths of hardworking archaeologists. So uh, I don't think that it's going to be a vocationals that are going to take the food out of the text mouth. I think it's going to be guys like me that go and get a PhD. And then, like, why wouldn't you hire a PhD to be a tech? They need a job. So, like, let's just hire this guy. He's got a PhD. Why not? We can teach him everything that we need to know. And so then when somebody finishes with a BA, they realize that everyone at the company has a master's and everyone has a PhD, right? So like, I'm not really so afraid of, of the community groups taking all our jobs. I'm afraid of guys like me that are willing to drop tens of thousands of dollars to be just an archaeologist, taking away the chance of like anyone else who wants to try to be an archaeologist. And then um, the, the robots thing, like, uh, I mean, uh, after... Uh, I, I pretty much, you know, broke my spine in uh, Washington digging shovel probes. And then I came down here and watched these guys just dig backhoe trenches galore. 
and all you had to do is just stand there and watch. Like, there's pits and all kinds of stuff just going on. And then they just strip off all the overburden, basically this part that they don't really think is significant, and then dig those features. And I know uh, other archaeologists who brought that same technique to Washington, and they, like, work against it, and they don't really want it to happen. And then magically they use it once, and they found a site, and it's going to, like, testing in the next level, right? So, like, the, the use of machines is already kind of a thing and it's just expanding even more i can see how that would expand you know all over the country once they got a chance to use a backhoe but uh the fact that maybe you would hook on a computer onto that machine and then just have it run with like one archaeologist watching that i mean there goes the whole crew that was going to dig shovel probes there goes all eight techs they were going to dig that thing when there's just a, a trained archaeologist you know that's monitoring this machine itself digging the backhoe trenches itself there goes, you know, eight people's entry level job so that one overeducated archaeologist can watch the machine do the work. Like that's that's what I think is the biggest fear. I mean, we've changed who is an archaeologist definitely through like trying to get more diversity and having more classes and then just like student loans and more people interested in the field. It's still, you know, within a certain race, but there's a wide amount of people who are doing archaeology and then with community archaeology you're you you know, hope the idea is that you'll build a consensus among communities to help with some of these other problems like curation and stuff. But the real fear, I didn't even really think about it until I started writing the post, is that we would just have machines and that we wouldn't have to have techs anymore. What do you guys think about that? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here because this is actually, uh, I have had a comment on it when you uh, first said it. Um, well, first, you know, because we are kind of speculating on what archaeology is going to be like, and, and I'm I'm actually surprised that you're talking about like a hundred years down the future. Because I think in twenty years down the future, um, what we what gets done as archaeology within cultural resource management is going to be drastically different. Um, we like the the, the presumption that that the field tech is the archaeologist. Um, I, I have like issues with that. Um, reason we have field techs and, and lab techs, like you say, is because it's really labor intensive. That um, and and as techniques get refined, whether it's through like you know really smart robots or whatever, um, you know, yeah, th those those positions are gonna gonna dwindle away. But that doesn't mean like all of archaeology is gonna dwindle away. Um, it, it's it's gonna be different. Um, and and part of it is. That we have a very strong inventory specific um, set of methods that you know we go out and we cover huge areas and yeah we we write off some some areas because you know the, the standing water or swamps or you know it's it's really steep slope but you know still um, what we're doing is heavily labor intensive because you know we're, we're digging shovel tests maybe on on a you know fifteen or a thirty meter interval or you know we're walking you know, thousands of acres in, in you know, surface survey um, that maybe this whole wholesale approach to surveying um, isn't going to be the, the method of the future. Um, you know, I, I think part of it comes down to, you know, what's our focus? And, and um, I'm still in the process of writing my uh, challenges of archaeology uh, blog post, but one of the issues is that, um, you know, our, our set of methods that we do, the, the entire legislated process for cultural resource, for archaeology within cultural resources is heavily dependent on our notions of archaeology at the time these laws were written. Um, you know, so we're using a lot of concepts that, you know, other archaeologists who aren't doing CRM you know, ha have since had issues with, you know, whether it's like sites as a unit or, um, you know, I mean, we're very much still steeped in the idea of cultural history and or, um, you know, I, th I think it was Sarah Hare on Twitter um, once made a reference that most of our research questions are based on like disco archaeology because, you know, th these theoretical frameworks all came from the 70s. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of true that, you know, we do we are doing archaeology in a very old way and, and in a lot of ways, an outdated way. Um, you know, and, and so 
the challenge for us, you know, one of our grand challenges is what's what's the new way going to be? How how, how is archaeology as a method going to change? And not even a hundred years down the road, I'm thinking like ten or fifteen or even twenty. Um, it's it's going to be around the corner, and and part of it's going to be driven by like Bill was talking about. It, it, it's the curation issue. You know, we don't have enough places to put all that stuff. Um, you know, some of it's the the I want to say the labor issue, but from the other side that you know labor is expensive. People are expensive, and you know, our clients are going to be wanting cheaper, you know, cheaper and cheaper rates. And our innovations are going to have to be in, in labor saving devices. Um, you know, we, we can talk about like digital recording because that saves, you know, saves labor in that we're not going to have to tra hire um, lab techs or, you know, office people to transcribe our field notes. But that's also one less position, right? Yeah, it's a conundrum. Yeah. And with like digital recording, I see that as like a positive because that's one of those examples where you're not really taking someone's job away. You're just like reducing the amount of overhead hours it takes for someone, you know, to transcribe paper notes. And it's also something that doesn't um, like water down the work capacity of the person doing it versus like, you know, if you've got like an automated heavy machinery that's doing backhoe trenches, you know, there's all sorts of problems with that. Well, I, I think so. But at the same time, you know, from a business perspective, you don't hire people to hire people. You have you hire people to get work done. Yeah. And, you know, up here in the north where, you know, we have winter. And so work just kind of dwindles, like the amount of work that needs to get done um, that, you know, yeah, having someone scan all those paper copies, that could be a person's position for a couple of months. And, 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 you know, okay, you, you remove that and it's like, well, that person can do other stuff, but there isn't other stuff to be done. So, you know, it, it really does, you know, less labor means less jobs in, in a mm. really basic perspective. Um, and, and I mean, on, on the other hand, you know, some of those jobs that we are removing with technology, um, it, it kind of sucks, you know, shovel tests suck. Um, <laughs> very few people enjoy doing shovel tests. Um, and, and, and a lot of people, I don't know why, seem to flee to Southern California or something like that so they can do, you know, surface survey instead. Um, that, you know, the, these are labor-saving devices which help, like, an individual person out. It's like, hey, I don't have to dig as many shovel tests. But in the long run, it also means that there's going to be less of a demand for people. You know, and I'm wondering if, and, and you know, I hadn't thought about this far ahead in, in uh in, you know, before the show, but, you know, in this conversation, I, you know, I'm now wondering, you know, what's the, the idea that, you know, what's an archaeologist then? And, and it's like, there will still be archaeologists, there still, still will be cultural resources, but, you know, not necessarily at the field tech level. So we might actually be going to a slightly older model of, like, you know, who's an archaeologist? How do you hire an archaeologist? How do you become an archaeologist? That, yeah. you know, maybe the field tech um, a as a position will be greatly reduced, if not, you know, altogether gone. Well, yeah, I've been seeing of... that in a lot of the companies I've worked with, too. Like, you guys have mentioned, you know, like an office full of MAs and no techs. Like, I've, I've worked for two offices like that. So I, th I think we're there, and like you guys have pointed out very well, that's that's the challenge is like, how do we manage the tasks that are done for the overhead that we're charging? Well, uh, you know, and I, that is one of the things that I said as far as like the DNA of, um, of who is an archaeologist cha changing because we've got, you know, archaeologists that have MBAs and you know, companies are perfectly okay with hiring an MBA, uh, you know, to do work there. They're perfectly okay with hiring a GIS specialist. They've got a master's in GIS. They've got a master's in, uh, uh, they've got a JD, a law degree, and they're all out there, they're doing archaeology, but then when they get back to the office, they've got a whole new role, right? So, like, uh, especially cultural resource management has changed what it means to even be an archaeologist, and and I think you guys are right. Basically, um, you know, it's so messed up to say this out loud, but uh, 
the Secretary of the Interior standards of who is an archaeologist does not it does not cover field techs, and so companies have less and less incentive to hire field techs because if they can hire an actual archaeologist that fits the Secretary of Interior standards or has a specialty like GIS or um, interpreting you know data from drones or data management. Um, I, I, I don't think it was meant to include field techs. It, it is specifically for um, the people you know who are basically the PIs. The Secretary of Interior qualifications are for people who are designing and running the projects, not not necessarily the field tech level. Yeah, I, but I mean, it, I I was a tech for a long time, and when I was a tech, I thought I was a archaeologist. Well, you're you're yeah. doing archaeology, and that makes you an archaeologist, but that doesn't make you a PI. Oh yeah, I know, but I mean, it's like a total. I don't know what to say. It's just like well, it's, something. It, it, it's one of those realizations. One day you look in the mirror and you're like, "Wow, I'm that old now." Like you look in the <laughs> mirror and you're like, "Wow, I wasn't an archaeologist. Like that's crazy, but now I am." Uh, I, I would disagree with that. I, I I think that it's, um, kind of a, some sort of nested typology. Um, like in in the federal, uh, what is it? The Office of Oh, help me out, Personal, Doug. Personnel Management (OPM). Yeah. Um, that you know they they do separate like like there's an archaeologist position and then there's uh, an archaeological technician, um, which doesn't mean that the person whose p position is labeled archaeological technician isn't doing archaeology, isn't isn't an archaeologist, and isn't getting paid for it. I mean, they're clearly getting paid for it. Um, but it's it, it's kind of the difference between like the people who you know, are following the process to do the work and the people who are making the decisions of what work it's done. And, and you know, I've actually had uh, far too many arguments about, about my conception of the difference between a professional and technician, but it, it, it really is true. Like you look at forestry, foresters versus forestry technicians, same sort of thing. You're looking at like while. Uh, wildlife biologists versus wildlife technicians, same sort of thing, that you have the professional level, which is making the decisions about, you know, how things are managed, what should be done, and, and how it should be done. And then you have the technicians who, you know, carry it out, um, which doesn't mean that technicians don't, you know, are, are like, not, like, they don't have any agency in, in what they're doing, but it, it, it it is a basic way of categorizing like what your roles are in your particular job. So, you know, what your job duties are going to be. Hey guys. Uh, I think we've, we've probably, we need to go on to other people's sort of grand challenges. Um, so just to keep this moving along, Chris, um, I think we need to do a break real quick. And then when we come back, do you want to tell us about your thoughts on the grand challenges? Sure thing. These things we make no apology for the study of archaeology. But we don't do dinosaurs. Did the aliens build Stonehenge? Did the Easter Island statues walk? Did the Vikings colonize Midwest America? What does mainstream archaeology have to say about all of this? Listen to the Archaeological Fantasies podcast and learn about popular archaeological mysteries. Hoax or fact? Learn to tell the difference with Dr. Kenneth Fader and co-host Sarah of the Archie Fantasies blog. Check out the show on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash Archie Fantasies and get ready to think critically. Let's get back to the show. Funny beady blokes you will see are a staple of archaeology. And we're back. Uh, so we just heard from Stephen and Doug and Bill about uh, the grand challenges of archaeology. And uh, I'm also working on one for my blog, Go Dig a Hole. And I've had a hard time really, like, narrowing it down enough. Um, and I've kind of touched on it before with an older post about how I feel that uh, CRM archaeology is kind of culpable in unsustainable development. And... I think that that's that's the challenge that I want to address, and I'd really like your guys' input on, you know, how to focus this towards something productive to talk about. But uh, in all, 
what I think needs to happen moving forward in archaeology is that um, CRM archaeology should be more aligned with green jobs and green industries. And we do see some of that happening with the larger engineering firms that are providing renewable energy. Uh, a lot of them have like an archaeology component folded into their whole staff. But um, I just feel like archaeology is such an obvious extension of sustainability when you look at it in terms of like we study the way humans use resources and interact with the environment and we're the best people to comment on that in terms of its current day and future relevance. And so I think that moving forward as archaeologists in CRM archaeology and, you know, as the broader discipline goes, uh, I feel that it could be mutually beneficial to help us with public engagement and also help us with our public perception as a relevant discipline. Um, so I don't know, you guys want to jump in on that and tell me what you think? Well, uh, there um, one time I was talking to a class of uh, high school students and saying that, uh, you know, anthropology and archaeology works within one belief system and that I've met individuals who really don't want to have anything to do with me because I've dug up skeletons and so they, you know, associate me with spirits of the past, spirits that I really shouldn't be messing with. However, you know, because I'm an archaeologist, that was just my job, right? So, and I think in some ways it is very similar because I can't tell you how many times I've paid my bills by letting someone build yet another crappy condo tower or, you know, helped excavate somebody's ancestors so that we can have, you know, another uh, municipal courthouse or, you know, there's just so many things that I've ended up doing. Yeah. Walmart, Safeways, all kinds of stuff that like the 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 bad mojo or whatever like it's all over me. Like I helped make way for all that stuff. So on the one hand, we can say, well, at least we learned something about the past because if I hadn't helped with that, we wouldn't have any idea what was there, you know. But then on the other hand, if I had not done that, they what? I mean, we might think that maybe altruistically they would not have brought that project forward. But the reality is, they would have just destroyed all that archaeology without doing anything. And then we'd have yet another Walmart that five years later is being closed and have destroyed the past. So it's really like, I mean, the, the money's in the construction, right? So whether it's, a, you know, way over budget freeway tunnel in um, Seattle or another uh, outlet mall in Oro Valley, Arizona, like either which way, they're building unsustainable stuff and there's like not really that much we can do to stop it. And uh, I think it would be difficult to have a career where you didn't have any sin on your hands. So, like, you just take the good with the bad. Like, every time I helped for a solar development, it didn't hurt my feelings. But, you know, uh, that's, like, one compared to every townhouse and subdivision I helped make wake for. I really yeah. don't know how to reconcile it. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think you get to choose what your clients do. Um, and, and I don't think you should get to choose what your clients do as far as what their project is that's driving, you know, compliance, um, is, is that, you know, we work with people who are doing development. Um, if you really want to get sustainable, um, that's reduce reduction of uh, development, probably. And our involvement will, you know, decrease the demand for, you know, our, our work will decrease. Um, I... You know, on the other hand, you know, to, to take it, you know, a long view, that every time there's development, there is potentially um, opportunities to aid in planning as far as the effects on archaeology. Um, and then, you know, all development things eventually, you know, turn into archaeological things. That um, there are, you know, all this infrastructure that keeps getting added, you know, this sustainability factor is how that's maintained, how that's updated. Um, and, and, you know, that might be an avenue for future archaeology further down the road. But, but as far as, you know, picking and choosing, like, I, I only want to work on green projects or I only want to do this, that's really outside of the purview of what we do, um, you know, at least, at least with the way that uh, cultural resources, um, the, the process works right now. 
presumably, um, you know, maybe if, if regulations change further down the road, there will be uh, sustainability will be a factor in whether a project happens or not, or how a project happens or not. But as archaeology, I'm not so certain we'd be involved with that part. Yeah, I'm probably with Stephen on this. I'm, the system's not really set up for us to have input on what gets built. And I mean, occasionally, occasionally you find something that might cause a development to be changed or to be redesigned around it or to incorporate it and stuff. But um, I don't see us as being nearly, nearly far enough into, or I guess at the beginning of any sort of project development of any sort of construction to be able to say, no, actually we shouldn't be building a Walmart here. I mean, you could say that as a private citizen. Um, and that's something that I think is much larger than archeology. span It's something that should be talked about as a society about what is de uh, sustainable development and how it should be done. Um, and I, it's one of those sort of weird things is in most countries, if you look at the heritage laws, it's essentially a polluter pays. So the work we're doing is sort of an offset, a uh, mitigation for the damage that's going to be done to the archeological or historical record. And so our job is, you know, basically society's already decided we need to build roads, we need to build hospitals, and we do need, you know, another condo block or, you know, urban sprawl of hundreds upon hundreds of houses um, out in the middle of nowhere in a desert where there's no water. Um, and I think that's, you're talking about a really big, if this is a challenge, you're talking about something that's that's grander than archaeology. I don't know, Chris. I think we can carve a niche. I think that there's some service providers that can actually specialize in sustainability and heritage conservation, and that what's messed up is they might be so good that they would just get to the point where they dominate all the sustainable builds, and then I'm left to just become even more blackened by making way for mini malls. <laughs> <laughs> There are plenty of firms that specialize in um, certain types of project sectors. So, um, you know, I've, I've known plenty of firms that are, you know, what they do is like res residential development or, or uh, oil and gas or um, and, and that's more a they, they've kind of carved out a market of clients who come to them. And it's like we have, you know, we know what your projects are you know, we're ready to do the archaeology in support of those projects. So so you can play it that way, that you can actually try to carve out a niche, you know, as far as, like, your familiar, familiarity with the issues involved with, say, like, wind farms. Because at that point, you've got a lot of visual impact type stuff as well as, you know, footprints. So, you know, I, I don't want to be like, you You know, you can't possibly do this. You, you can do that. You, you can try to focus your... um expertise in a certain type of uh, industry. Uh, the downside is that's, that's, that's a really bad business plan because eventually that work will dry up. But because you are so focused on one particular you know, development sector, um, long term is, is you know, you're going you're gonna to have super dry periods um, where you're probably going to have to close shop. Yeah, and we're kind of seeing that right now in the United States and probably elsewhere in the world too with like Nevada has is having a collapse of the mining industry, you know, like North Dakota is having a collapse of the fracking industry. And then oh, yeah. in Appalachia, you know, the coal industry is just all but gone. Yeah. It, it's um and and that's part of the boom bust cycle of um a lot of resource extraction. Uh that yeah, it's it's you know, some some years it's it's you can't hire enough archaeologists, and other years um, nobody's looking for an archaeologist because nobody's uh, looking to expand their development. Um, but you, you know, you you it could be possible to be like we specialize in wind farms, and we're familiar with all all the issues involved with wind farms or something like that. Um, you know, another thing to consider is that archaeology is a very tiny ass well tiny it's it's probably one of the more expensive but it's, it's a relevant part of a larger cultural resource practice that involves like architecture 
and sustainable reuse of historic architecture is a big thing. Um, and, and that might be a good avenue. Um, if, if you really want to focus on green stuff and sustainability, that might be a good avenue to, uh, to approach. Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of what I've been stewing on as, as I've been, you know, carving out an outline for this blog post that I'll eventually submit to the blogging carnival is, you know, like what are some creative ways to move forward? And I, I think that's a good idea with, you know, maybe aligning ourselves more with urban planners and, you know, design firms and stuff like that. That way we're, but not, not to solely focus on that, like you had warned against Stephen, um, you know, to more diversify rather than pigeonhole ourselves. So that's how our current system is set up. But I mean, there's nothing to say that archaeology shouldn't make green development a priority and then lobby for that at the local level for ordinances and stuff like that, or at the state or national level. Um, you know, you got the Koch brothers who do that for all sorts of crazy stuff um, that's not yeah. related to their oil and whatever, though a lot of it is. Um, so there's nothing to say that as citizens of our communities or states or countries or world, we can't take an active participation and try to push stuff because that's basically the whole political process is people coming together and relatively peacefully hashing out their differences and what they want to see happen in the world. Oh, hell, down here in Arizona, I'm starting to see companies just basically buy properties and be the developers. Or or the not developers. I mean, you guys should you guys should Google uh, Archaeology Southwest. They've just gone straight heritage conservation. They're just helping tribes uh, uh, consult with the government and with other CRM firms. They've decided that it's just a good idea to buy pueblos and sites that have them, and then manage that property like for themselves. And uh, there's also a lot of other heritage conservation minded groups in the West. I've talked about this guy numerous times on my blog called Bill Naito and he was uh, um, like a second generation Japanese guy that lived in Portland who just started buying some of those um, riverfront properties to develop them to make money and uh, I mean he's been like kind of one of my heroes and my daughter's going wild in the background <laughs> anyway there you know there's different ways around it but essentially the it, uh, you know uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation started off as a rich guy who just started to buy buildings back east and to um, like keep them for historic preservation. And you know the same thing with the Archaeological Conservancy. So like you know the the cultural resources uh, industry has really been focused on these you know bite by bite plans to well we'll get a contract now and then we'll do those services and then we'll get another contract and we'll do those services. But they haven't really been focusing on the acquiring properties, taking part in heritage conservation laws, pushing local governments to steer things so that they get tax breaks and benefits, and capitalizing their companies through real estate um, in a way that you know, both protects whole neighborhoods and districts and also provides assets that they can draw upon in those times of drought. I mean, that's just like I don't see companies. That doesn't seem to be like anything I've seen a CRM company focus on. Archaeology Southwest is the first one I've ever seen to just buy sites and start managing them. Wow. Stephen, you, uh, you had said you had a couple of challenges you were thinking of. Um, I know you talked about one of them. Are there other ones you'd like to mention? Um, I, I think, and, and I, I kind of want to go back and, and actually talk about the original, what was it, 25, um, uh, 25 challenges is that um, I, I actually kind of like them. I, I like the notion of, you know, if, if archaeology continues to be a science, then we need larger questions that we can address. Um, and, and, you know, maybe those aren't the only ones, but, you know, those are a good thinking point for those of us who have to, you know, who are basically out there identifying properties and trying to ascertain whether they could provide important information or not that those original you know challenges you know are, are decent like themes that we could assess um archaeology or archaeological properties towards um but i i think that a lot of like i i think there's really one grand challenge 
um, that, that there is, is, is like one large challenge that kind of over uh, overarches like everything that we've been talking about. And actually it's, it's come up a few times. Um, and this is kind of the punchline of my blog. So I, I guess after I write it and submit it that um, you're not gonna have to you know, read my blog. You know, the, the big thing is relevancy. Um, that, that, that is the big challenge of archeology span today. Um, whether you're an academic and it's like, no, really, as a social science, we can contribute. Or in, in cultural resources of the, you know, important aspects of cultural resources, you know, you have historic buildings and, and structures and, and, and you have um, uh, like, you know, like um, for the uh, National Register of Criteria, you know, you ha have um, association with important events and important persons and you know um and and these are tie into how we are as a community um and and how we as a community identify ourselves that these were important events and, and and important historical figures that help shape us how we are that there's a really strong um emotional tie to the history of a location um and, and the same goes for like you know tribal properties and and, and you know um uh, like traditional cultural properties and, uh, you know, uh, you know, e even to a lesser extent, you know, the, the, you know, criterion C, which is design that, you know, this is the last building of this, you know, design type and, and we need to preserve it. And, and these are really easy things to sell as far as their importance. And, and then way down, most of what we do as, as archaeologists, way down there on criterion D, and we're like, no, really, this 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 hearth and and handful of flakes and and is really important, and, and why? That that we have this notion that you know these things are important, and we aren't really good at making a, a like a relevancy sale. Like, why is this relevant to? Our notions of importance on, on par with you know the historical events or, or persons that you know shape us as a community, um, and and I think that you know the grand challenges as you know they were published in American Antiquity could lend you know so, some weight to that. Like hey, this is contributing, and it's like it's not just this one particular site, but this site, you know, coupled with the other you know hundred thousand sites helps us answer important questions about people, about us. Um, and, and, you know, but also like, you know, talking about like what Bill was talking about with, um, you know, uh, uh, like the future of um, cultural resource archeology span and, and what Chris was talking about with, uh, you know, tr sustainability and issues like that is that we're all kind of looking for, um, Kind of, kind of like an answer to the relevancy challenge. Like, why is what we do important, or how can we change what we do to make it more important? Yeah. And and really, that that's you know, I, I don't have any good answers. Um, but I, I think that you know, some some place where we fail, and and you know, you know, as, as an industry is is like no really what we're doing is super important. Um, when all they see us do is like go out there, dig a bunch of holes, find you know a handful of rocks, um, and and the it's, the tie-in is kind of lacking. Um, you know, if if you're talking about like traditional knowledge, or you know, this is an archaeological site and it's the traditionally known historic area for X, then you got something to work with. But for most of what we're doing, you know, particularly if we even want to entertain the notion that you know we're a science um we're, we're doing a really bad job at that um and so in my blog as it's half written in my notebook right now um you know it, it starts out with you know kind of a broad or, or not even broad uh it starts out actually kind of like here's a specific research question that i have an issue with here's um the theoretical framework that CRM has to deal with, you know, the cultural history stuff. Um, and, and this is how we're doing it. And then it ties into, you know, the, the bigger picture of um, relevancy. Like how is all this, how is cultural history relevant? 
Um, and and what can we do to to make it so? Man, I'm so glad you brought up that article from American Antiquity because I remember going through all those 25 questions and being like, <laughs> none of those seem relevant to like anything. I mean, they're oh. all relevant. They're all relevant if like you already have the money and you have the project area and you're like ready to go do archaeology and then you're like oh okay well let's talk about urbanism and like how does conflict play a role and like you know like after you've already done a lot of what we're talking about after you've convinced the company that it's relevant after you've already like you know decided whether you're going to use drones or you know all this stuff okay now we've got data okay now here's the relevant questions and so I hope that none well, of those guys who wrote that are listening to this blog post, but like it, when I read it not. back then, but... <laughs> it was like, wow, this is like 50 grad students essentially that all thought of like, what's the most relevant thing to what I'm studying right now? And then, you know, <laughs> we're, we're talking about stuff of, that actually enables archaeology to happen. And after you've already enabled it, then you turn to that thing like, oh yeah, those are you're right. We still haven't answered any of this stuff. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I gotta defend that in, in that I completely disagree. Um, that these are the big theory questions, and they're not going to be answered by any one project that we do. But if you ever do like a National Park Service style like historic context, is that you look at historic properties, individual ones, and talk about what themes they can meet under. And, and how do they contribute? And so, you know, yeah, th this requires a large amount of data and, and a large amount of synthesis that we're not going to do because that's not part of our scope of work. That's not our deliverable. But this, these are the big questions, or these are big questions. Uh, you know, given the sample issues with uh, how that survey went, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are other big questions, but it's nice to actually get some. You know, as opposed to going out, looking at a tiny site, if you find a site, and then, you know, looking at, you know, you don't have research questions. You're just trying to say what it is. And, and what we're doing, you know, I, and, and this actually ties into one of my pet peeves about CRM archaeologists, is that um, there is the bullshit notion that what, we're the real archaeologists because we're out there digging holes. And what we're doing is collecting data. And we're collecting a huge amount of data that is filling up um, the curation facilities and, and databases with data. And we don't even know if we're collecting the correct data because we are doing it atheoretically. We don't know what the big questions are. We're just assuming that all the data as we collect it in the manner that we collect it is going to be relevant to a larger picture, you know, larger syn synthesis. The advantage of having those questions framed um, gives us like, how are we gonna record, you know, that data? How, how are we gonna um, do that? Because that's what we're doing. We're not doing the actual interpretation of archeology. span We are doing data collection and, and that's it. That's the only portion of archeology span that we really do. You know, out, outside of coordination with uh, like traditional properties and stuff like that, which is, you know, not the basic run of um, archaeology within the CRM framework. So I'm going to jump in there with a couple of comments. Um, and one is just to sort of take this into a larger context. And I, I, I've seen some criticism of, you know, this, uh, this exercise of looking at big challenges, I actually think it's a brilliant thing. So in terms of when you're going for, so for a very specific part of archaeology, which is, you know, justifying what you're doing, and this is going back to what Stephen's talking about, if you're going to a grant body or you're doing research and you're doing something like that, a lot of the time it comes down to when you put it in, into a grant proposal or something like that, you basically end up saying, this is imp important because I think it's important. I have a hunch that it's important. And when you do a sort of a framework like this, you end up with a lot of people saying, you know, actually there's a lot of big questions. These are questions that a lot of different people think are worth answering. That's why you should fund me because lots of other people have said that this is worth funding. And so there's that aspect. But um, in the UK, they have regional research frameworks, 
which is basically this, but at the regional level, except Scotland is all of Scotland, even though they're starting to break down to regions. Um, and basically what's happened in the last 20 years is they get together all the experts in a region and they say, what don't we know about the archaeology? And so they actually end up with these very big census of all the archaeology that's been done in an area and what we don't know and a bunch of questions. And so I don't want to speak ill and piss a lot of people off. I'm hoping they're not listening. The first generation of those kind of failed. Like they had good questions, um, but basically they gathered all this information, did a synthesis, and then there was a hard, hard reason to do a connection. And just now they've done a big call and they're moving more technical. So the idea now is that um, and I, I've possibly might be getting, the reason I mentioned this is I might be getting funding to do this is basically that when you put in a CRM report and you put it into a database, you'll then be able to connect that to a regional framework, a regional goal, and be able to say, we excavated this site and we think it might add information to, I don't know, you know, Pueblo 2 pottery because it's not usually found in this area. And we know that because they've done a big regional research and we can now tie together what we found to this, the questions that are being asked regionally and those questions might, you know, fit up into something bigger. And because that is basically, you know, Everyone's like, oh, why do you need to study, you know, uh, I don't know, snail shells? It's because little bits of information, even though it's very specific, can actually lead into and create an ecosystem of knowledge that helps you answer the big questions. So I, I think I like this idea of grand challenges um, and that it allows us to say, you know, these are the big questions we should be answering. How do we get there? And that it also allows other people to join in and and connect to it. So as Stephen was saying, we're doing basically data collection when we work in CRM. And and there have been like so I know of one sort of regional framework in south southeastern New Mexico. Um, they basically it went like this. They did a big census. They know all the sites that have been done up till 2004, 2005 when they did it. And they had a bunch of questions they could ask. And so now afterwards, it doesn't work because it's paper based, but in theory, you could basically go back and say, we've just done this site. We didn't know what we found because we were digging it, but now back on analysis, we actually know it fits into this regional framework and you make a link. And so people can find your CRM report and then they can connect that and someone else can come and look at that data. So I, I think they're actually quite, quite good things to be doing. Yeah. And you guys are exactly right. You're exactly right. All I was saying is when I'm hungry, I go to my refrigerator, but that assumes that I have a house and a fridge and that that fridge has food in it. You know what I'm saying? So like you guys, you're exactly right. These are the things that need to move us forward in the next century. And uh, it is, you're right. It's not just a, a futile exercise. You know, we are collecting data. They do address these themes and these are really great things to focus on. However, they assume that we're doing archaeology like any which way. That's the only thing I wanted to point out. Uh, what do you mean by any which way? That assumes that you've done a good enough job of convincing your state legislature that it's relevant, that historic preservation and you know heritage conservation is not something that we should get rid of, or that just because we're at war perpetually with terrorism, that the you know uh, homeland security should be able to construct whatever they want because they don't want to be slowed down by defending our country in order to look for archaeological sites, right? Like. They already passed that, um, I don't know if it's an order or a law or whatever that says that Homeland Security doesn't necessarily have to follow with uh, environmental um, assessments because they're protecting our country. So that's just one agency. However, the battle continues like every year to get rid of uh, the National Historic Preservation Act and those other laws that really drive a lot of this data collection. So we have these grand questions that we'd love to answer and actually I think some of these things probably could be addressed by that mountain of stuff that you and I and everybody else have spent our lives collecting through CRM projects. If we actually had the time to go back through collections and all these other documents, we might be able to shed some light on these things. But uh, with the threat towards getting rid of cultural resources legislation looming like perpetually, um, I, I just felt like maybe it's a little bit like putting the cart before the horse to you know, bring up the grand questions. However, 
I respect you guys and I listen to you guys and you are exactly right. Those big questions are, that's the way I need to be looking instead of worrying about like, you know, getting projects and contracts. I, you're right. I need to be looking at the wider thing of what I'm doing more often. So, uh, I just meant that it assumes that we, we are doing cultural resources and we, you know, have that available for us to do in order to add data to this, to answer some of these things. Um, if that gets taken away from us through a change in laws or a change in the regulatory context or, you know, um, I've heard of all kinds of things like privileging um, prehistoric stuff over the historical so they barely even collect any historical while they focus on the prehistoric. Then we have no idea about that ranching family or, you know, that whole like uh, homestead that was on the property because we barely even collected any historical because we were really going for the archaic. That was like what we were after. And I understand that it's balancing um, priorities, but um, some of these, some of those questions and the grand challenges, if our if our situation changes, if we don't listen to what Stephen's saying and uh, vouch for our own relevancy, though it'll kind of be a moot point anyway. That's kind of why I uh, I, op- I sort of aped the uh, their survey from a couple of years ago and and opened it up to what are the grand challenges unfiltered to see because I, I do suspect and you can actually go and read the 40 percent of answers that they um basically rejected uh, a lot of them do say a lot of this, the very same things we've been talking about um because I, I do think it is it's it's that was very specific to science but i think there are a lot more grand challenges across archaeology than uh just the ones that are aimed at science Nice. Well, do you guys have any uh, other thoughts or um, directions for challenges before we close up this episode? Well, the one thing I wanted to say is I really like these uh, blogging carnivals because they bring me out of my little, you know, soapbox and get me to think about some other things. So <laughs> thanks, Doug, for, for bringing this kind of stuff up, it really, you know, gets me, gets my uh, mind working in a different way. So I really, I like the blogging carnivals. I enjoy participating in them. Yeah. So Doug, um, this is all taking part on Doug's website. It's dougsarchaeology.com, right? Uh, it's dougsarchaeology.wordpress.com. Okay. It's just one of those and free WordPress sites, so it's it's nothing fancy. Gotcha. And you're running this, uh, you're accepting submissions until when? It will be until February 1st, so if anyone has a blog and wants to participate um, or if you want to participate, just send me an email with your thoughts and I'll post it to my blog as well. Um, and basically it goes till February 1st um, and it goes for a little while after that, actually. So February 1st is just where I pull together where everyone said into sort of a census with all the links so that you can see what other people have said um, across, you know, across the internet. And so it's basically the first, but I'll probably as happened in other blogging carnivals, people sort of forget until like February 2nd or 3rd, and I just add them at the end. So, you know, if people are in there late, it's fine. It's just you may not be get the initial sort of look with everyone else when everyone's going through and seeing what everyone else said. But, um, yeah, basically the first is if you guys can have your post done by then, be much appreciated. Yeah. And uh, this episode of the podcast is going to air on January 20th. So any listeners who uh, come across this uh, topic, you know, they'll still have um, a few days to get their submissions in. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks so much for joining us, guys. And uh, we'll talk to you next time on the CRM Archaeology Podcast. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash CRM Arc Podcast. If you like the show and want to comment, please do. You can leave comments about this or any other episode on the website or on the iTunes page for the episode. You can also email me at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com or use the contact form on the podcast webpage. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or tweet your questions with the hashtag crmarcpodcast or you can tag at arcpodnet in your tweet. Please share the link to the show wherever you saw it. 
share CRM archaeology related items on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else for that matter, be sure to use the hashtag CRMARC so the community can see and comment. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. You can also type the name of the podcast into your favorite podcasting app and subscribe that way. Don't forget to go over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It helps us get noticed so more people can find our podcast and benefit from the content. Also, send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Also, please consider donating to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Your donations help fund our bandwidth and contribute to our editing costs. This show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle, and was edited by Chris Webster. Oh, do you want to you wanna scream on the microphone? Come here. What do you have to say, Lydia? Oh, now she's all quiet. <laughs> now she doesn't want to cry anymore, huh? This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to arcpodnet.com slash members for more info.